So, you want to get into Genshin's TCG, but you don't know where to start when it comes to building decks. Well, this video is for you. From understanding general terms to identifying practical synergies, this video will give an overview and walk you through everything you need to know and consider when it comes to making any kind of deck. A helpful table of contents for this video is provided here and will pop up as we transition into each segment for ease of finding information throughout the video. And a more detailed table of contents will be located in the video's description. Genshin's TCG decks can generally fit into one of three archetypes, aggro, ramp, or stall. These archetypes can best be defined by their speed or how fast they can start exerting pressure on the opponent. Aggro or aggressive decks are the fastest and can usually start dishing out large amounts of damage within the first couple of rounds. Because of this, these decks tend to dominate the early game and focus heavily on lower cost buffs and the abilities of their character cards more than most. Ramp decks, sometimes called mid-range decks, are slower than aggro decks and prefer to spend the early rounds investing in support cards that then pay off in the mid-game. Usually, by round 3 or 4, these decks can pull ahead of their opponents and make up for the previous round's lost time. Stall decks are the slowest of the three archetypes and opt to heavily invest in consistent and long-term healing and shields. These decks aim to win the Battle of Attrition by forcing opponents to exhaust all of their resources before coming out on top in the later rounds, usually after round 4. While Genshin's TCG tends to frequently award aggression, no one archetype is inherently better than any other. Instead, it's better to either find an archetype that you enjoy, or allow the deck's archetype to develop naturally based on the cards you choose to put in it. Despite that being said, some deck playstyles work better with certain archetypes. Deck playstyles are often defined by their elemental reactions or resonance, and their win conditions. Elemental reaction and resonance categories are easy enough to understand. For example, there could be a Dendro Resonance Catalyze deck, or a Pyro Resonance Vaporize deck. Some decks might not have resonances, such as a Superconduct Swirl deck. Equally as important as identifying key reactions in the deck's playstyle is identifying the deck's win conditions. Win conditions define the play styles of decks based on what it is that the deck needs to achieve to win a match. And while there are far too many variables available to discuss every single win condition possible, it is worth highlighting some common win condition templates, such as Summon Decks. These decks utilize character and action cards that spawn summons and focus on doing damage during the end phase of each round and typically include elements that can create AoE reactions, such as Superconduct or Electrocharge, or high damage single target reactions like Vaporize, Melt, or Catalyze. Burst Decks These decks focus on quickly getting out their character card's bursts, often using a handful of energy cards, and can frequently do lethal surprise attacks. While not always the case, character cards with high damage low cost bursts like some Fatui cards, work well in these decks. One Turn Kill Decks These decks focus on setting up insta-kill combos that can wipe out an entire team in a single round. These decks are often highly aggressive, forgoing most healing cards in lieu of cards that facilitate their combos more quickly. Because of this, these decks tend to struggle in the mid to late game, or if the key character to their combo falls too soon. Common character cards for these decks include Yoimiya, Ayaka, Klee, Bennett, and Sing So. And these decks are usually Melt or Vaporize Pyro Resonance decks that maximize reaction damage. Control Decks These decks focus on controlling which opposing character card is active so that the opponent can't set up or achieve their own win condition. These decks often use Animo Resonance, Freeze Reactions, or character cards that can restrict the opponent's ability to swap freely and cheaply, such as the Mirror Maiden and Electro Hypostasis. Shield Decks These decks focus on creating large shields that can absorb massive amounts of damage, forcing opponents to exhaust their resources just to do a small amount of damage. While usually Geo Resonance decks, with the right combination of action and character cards, 
These decks can also include other elements. Keep in mind that this is not an exhaustive list of wind conditions, and sometimes triggering the reactions themselves is the wind condition for some decks, such as some Pyro Resonance or Catalyze decks. Deck mechanics refer to the specific features of a deck and the cards within it. As of Update 3.7, there are currently six main mechanics that are important to understand before constructing a deck. Quick Swap and Free Swap Quick Swap and Free Swap cards and abilities facilitate the quick and cheap swapping of the active character card. Card Draw Engines These are the action cards that allow decks to draw more cards per round. Most decks, especially those that depend on very specific cards, such as Pyro Resonance cards or Wolf's Gravestone, need a great deal of card draw engines in the deck. Dice Generators These are the cards that produce more dice for each round. Many decks, especially ramp decks, contain a number of these cards so that they can pull ahead of the opponent's dice count each round. Dice Rigging Dice rigging involves ensuring that the dice needed for each round are the dice rolled each round. Heal and Sustain These are the action cards and abilities that keep the character cards alive, whether it be through healing or producing shields. Buffs and Energy These are the action cards and abilities that strengthen character cards or generate energy for them. The use of these cards depends entirely on the character cards in the deck. Understanding these available mechanics is important for knowing the strengths and limitations of each individual deck. Now that we have an understanding of the important terms, it's time to start building a deck. The natural starting point for building any deck is to choose the character cards, but it's important to not consider these cards in isolation from the action cards. The biggest points to consider when initially choosing the character cards are the synergies, the roles each character card will play in the deck, and the requirements to allow each character card to optimally function in its designated role. These concepts are best explained with actual examples. In this footage, my goal was to create a deck that put Amber in the main DPS role, focusing mostly on her burst. Because her burst is both Pyro and has Piercing, I thought to pair her with Ganyu, who has Cryo and Piercing, for strong single target reactions and decent AoE Piercing. To better get both characters' bursts out, I also put in Raiden to help provide energy. Each character card has its role, from DPS to reaction support and sub-DPS, to energy and buff support. Now it's time to get into the action cards. Since this deck's win condition revolves around bursts, the idea was to choose action cards that best synergized with this goal. There's more to choosing action cards than just synergies, however. It's also important to consider the cost efficiency of the cards, the amount of available support slots, and how long cards will remain in those slots, ramp investment versus payoff, and the overall balance of the deck mechanics mentioned earlier in this video. In regards to synergies, artifacts revolving around energy and the weapon LG of the end fit well enough into this, but since they are a bit expensive, I started by trying Hanachi Sato to help reduce the cost. Some standard starting points for dice rigging, card draw engines, and dice generators were also chosen, and then some energy generating cards. Some quick swap, additional buffing, and healing cards were then added to finalize the deck. There are two points still to discuss with this deck, cost efficiency and the investment versus payoff. On face value alone, the total cost of all of the cards is 35 dice, averaging to a 1.16 dice cost. Most decks will average around 1.2. The main payoff for the ramp investment is the artifacts, LG of the End, and the Adeptus' Temptations. That amounts to only 5 out of 30 cards though, which is a bit concerning. But the best way to detect flaws in the deck is to test it. The first turn goes fairly well. Most of the ramp goes down, and Raiden can immediately burst on round 2. However, this instantly reveals an issue with support slots. The Hanachi Asato cards are necessary for cheaply getting out future artifacts and weapons, but they take up support slots until then, and now the treasure-seeking Seelie is left out, leaving us at one card with no real refueling options. While this could just be an issue with the chosen opening hand, another important consideration, or the starting play, it also shows that there are too many long-term support cards that'll end up bottlenecking the deck's development. 
The next issue revealed is with the general strategy. Raiden can get her burst out on round two, but it leaves her open to heavy damage. The only healing viable for standby characters in the deck are the mushroom pizzas, so taking that heavy amount of damage early on is a problem. However, the general combo works out well between Raiden and Amber, but now the previously mentioned issue of the support slots comes back again, and one of the Hanachi Sato cards needs to be replaced for healing. A couple of other major issues are revealed by this one match. Number one, after only being used once, the Liu Su card did nothing for the rest of the match. The value of Liu Su is only made possible if we are able to swap back to Raiden, but since she never got any healing, this could never happen. And number two, we never utilized the treasure seeking Sealies to have a card draw engine. And number three, Ganyu didn't do much until the very end, and that only happened because Amber was low on HP. While we still won the match against the NPC, it is important to remember that, against real players, all of these issues would have likely resulted in a loss. It was obvious that the win condition had to change. Bursts weren't going to be consistent enough to carry an entire match against a real player. Eventually, after changing out Ganyu and Raiden for Mona and Venti, the deck became a Mondstadt normal attacking deck. With Mona in the deck, there wasn't as much of a need for quick swap cards, so most of those could be replaced with Wind and Freedom, and the Burst and Energy related cards were replaced with normal attack buffing cards. The combination of Gambler's Earrings and Wind and Freedom synergize well to set up one turn kill combos and Sanganomiya Shrine helps address some of the earlier healing issues. The biggest concern is with one of the three main points we haven't mentioned yet, the optimal requirements. For Amber to function at her best, she needs her skill card, Skyward Bow, and Gambler's Earrings active on her. And while Amber can do a lot of damage even without these, it still means that we need to stall a bit until we can at least get her skill card in play. But any kind of stall requires significant healing and sustaining cards, and the current version of the deck just didn't have that, nor could it afford to remove its ramp or payoff cards to flex more healing in. The only option was to go back and reevaluate the character cards again, and so Mona was replaced with Kokomi, and the final version of the deck became this. Another copy of Catherine had to be added back in to make up for Mona no longer being there, and Liu Su was flexed back in to help primarily with Venti's burst to force specific opposing character cards to take the brunt of the damage and be easy targets to start a one turn kill combo with Amber. Due to all of these early flaws being detected with the initial version of the deck, the importance of testing the deck against NPCs cannot be emphasized enough. Along with troubleshooting the deck, NPC testing allows you to uncover optimal starting hands and opening strategies in a controlled environment, as opposed to the randomness of PvP matchmaking. With all of that being said, you should have the general foundations for building any kind of deck. Remember these points, and remember that deck building is a process of trial and error. If you still have questions after watching this, feel free to ask them in the comments below, and feel free to click on the video on screen to see more Genshin TCG content.